what is up everybody what is up i hope you're doing well as this meets you and um i hope your day is um a beautiful one <laughs> a beautiful one is beautiful outside today where i'm at and um i just wanted to talk about the fight for reparations <laughs> fight for reparations of course this is what i'm talking about this is my reparations journey Gosh, Lee, um, I didn't expect to make this many videos about this particular subject matter, but I am. So um, it's because there's so much information in history on all of this. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the leading people in the facts that um, we've pretty much been fighting for self-determination and um, uh, encroachment against our people ever since the beginning of this um, United States. Um, so anyway, before I get into the deepness uh, of stuff that I've kind of come across, I am going to go ahead, play the intro, and um, then I'll be back with the information that I found. And please remember that this is um, fair use because um, I'm going to be reading through some articles and things and maybe watching a few videos uh, with you guys on um, on these people that held the torch um, from one generation to the next. So anyway, let me go ahead and play that intro and then I'll be back. I don't know everything. Nah. What do I look like, an expert? But I'm gonna tell you what I do know. You are invited to subscribe, share, like, and thumbs up this video. And enjoy another episode in this series. Keep coming back, because we do this weekly. Go to Tanya So Official for the latest updates and merch for our followers. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm back. Um, thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe and share. Like, subscribe and share. Like and subscribe and share because who? We, we got a whole lot of stuff that was not really revealed to us, and we had to go and dig um, to find some answers about why haven't Black people and um, Native Americans, you know, the redskins, the real redskins, copper-colored folks, why haven't we got reparations yet? It don't make no sense. Uh, of course, it doesn't make no sense. Um, so anyway... I am going to share out my screen and um, go over why it's um, based on information and my beliefs. Um, the, the truth is that the entire time that the United States has been the United States, our people have been um, uh, fighting for their freedom. We've been torn down some by the things, the various things that have occurred, but um, we still have these uh, warrior spirits inside of us. So I'm sharing out my screen so I can talk about the Ch uh, Chickamauga Cherokee um, people that um, 
we need to know about. <laughs> we need to know about because I think this is the um, one of the last uh, groups of um, um, American Indians, if we want to call them that, Americans, um, that really stood their ground, stood their ground against encroachment on their land, their livelihoods, their people, our people. If you got, if any of you guys got Cherokee in your bloodlines, which I do. So the Chickamauga Cherokee refers to a group that separated from the greater body of the Cherokee during the American Revolutionary War. The majority of the Cherokee people wished to make peace with the Americans near the end of 1776. Now I know this, um, this is, um, Wikipedia, but this is a simple Google search. Um, and I'm just going down a little bit of a rabbit hole. I haven't gotten super deep, but I know that Chickamauga also were the ones that had, uh, that first, uh, flag that we think of as the Confederate flag, um, as their, um, their flag, um, for their people, um, our people. Following several military setbacks and American reprisals, the followers of Ski Augusta or Red Chief Dragon Canoe moved with him in the winter of 1776-77 down to the Tennessee River away from their historic overhill Cherokee towns. Relocated in a more isolated area, they established 11 new towns in order to gain distance from colonist encroachments. The Frontier Americans associated Dragon Canoe and his band with their new town on Chickamauga Creek and began to refer to them as the Chickamaugas. Five years later, the Chickamauga moved further west and southwest into present-day Alabama, establishing five larger settlements. They were then more commonly known as the Lower, uh, Lower che Cherokee. This term was closely associated with people of these five lower towns. Okay. Um, we kind of went into that. Now I wanted to go into what they had to say about the wars because it, <laughs> okay. The Chickamauga Cherokee became known for their uncompromising enmity against the United States, U.S. settlers who had pushed them out of their traditional territory from running water town, dragging canoe led attacks on white settlements all over the American Southeast. The Chickamauga Lower Cherokee and the frontiersmen were continuously at war until 1794. Chickamauga warriors raided as far as Indiana, Kentucky, and Virginia, along with members of the Western Confederacy, which they helped establish. Because of the growing belief in the Chickamauga cause, as well as the U.S. destruction of homes of their Native American, uh, uh, of other Native Americans, the a majority of the Cherokee eventually came became uh, eventually came to be allied against the United States. Following the death of Dragon Canoe in 1792, his hand-picked successor, John Watts assumed control of the lower Cherokee. Under Watt's lead, the Cherokee continued their policy of Indian unity and hostility towards European Americans. Watt moved his base of operations to Willstown to be closer to his Muscogee allies. Before this, he had concluded a treaty in Pensacola with the Spanish governor of West Florida, Arturo O'Neill de Tyrone, <laughs> for arms and supplies which, uh, with which to carry on the war. And let's see, how long did, um, they said till 1794. So that was 20 years. That was about 20 years between 18, between 1776 and, uh, 1794. 
That sounds about right. So, you know, as the United States was becoming the United States, um, the Chickamauga wanted their lands and unity amongst the tribes. So maybe we need to listen to them. Maybe we need to listen. Um, so here is another resource that I looked at. And I think I have presented this on another, um, another, what you call it, uh, video. And this one is talking about General William Tecumseh Sherman, Sherman's special field order number 15, which is the one that, um, well, let's, let's read it. The phrase 40 acres and a mule was derived from General William Tecumseh's Sherm Tecumseh Sherman's special field order number 15 issued during the Civil War. On January 12th, 1865, near the end of Sherman's March to the Sea, Sherman and the Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton met with 20 Black community leaders in Savannah, Georgia, to get their input as to how Blacks would define freedom. The leaders expressed a need for land and a separate Black state. Hello? <laughs> they was talking about this in 1865. Okay. As a result of this meeting on January 16th, 1865, General Sherman issued special field order number 15 with set aside 7,600 square miles in a 30 mile wide tract of land inland from the sea along the Atlantic coast, coast stretching from Charleston, South Carolina to St. John's River near Jacksonville, Florida for the exclusive settlement by blacks. That uh, this area of land included all of the islands along the coastline between Charleston and St. John's River. The field order also guaranteed Black U.S. military protection as we, as well as 40 acres of tillable land per Black family plus other provisions such as a mule or horse in order to work the land. General Rufus Staxton, director of the South Carolina Freedmen's Bureau, was assigned by General Sherman to implement the order. Saxton later settled over 40,000 Black people on 40-acre 40 40 acre tracts of land on a national level. That land and other land was that was confiscated and abandoned as a result of the Civil War became the jurisdiction of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was headed by General Oliver Otis Howard in South Carolina and other states, Blacks were given temporary title to 40 acre, acre tracts of land pending a final decision on confiscated and abandoned lands of Confederate rebels. In the fall of that same year, 1865, President Andrew Johnson reversed Sturman's field order issue, issuing special pardons and returning the land to the Confederate rebels who stole the flag and paraded it as their own from the Chickamauga Cherokee. How y'all feel about that? Okay. I'm just, I don't know. I don't know how people feel, but it sound real odd and suspect to me. Um, so there's, there's that. And then let's fast forward to um, the 19... Early 1900s. The early 1900s. Here comes in a relative of mine. Buck Colbert Franklin. Buck Franklin was an attorney in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who is most notably known for defending the survivors of the Tulsa race, they say riot, but we know it was a massacre of 1921. He was also the fa father to the vulnerable civil rights advocate and historian John Hope Franklin. Franklin was born the 7th of 
10 on May 6, 1879, near the town of Homer in Pickens County, which I know about Pickens County, Chickasaw Nation, Indian Territory, currently Oklahoma. He was named Buck in honor of his grandfather. Okay, I shared. Uh, he was He's a grandfather of mine too, who had been a slave and purchased his freedom of his family and himself. There is speculation that the true origins of the Franklin's freedom came when Buck Franklin's father, David Franklin, escaped from his plantation and changed his name early in the Civil War. Practicing law as a young man in the predominantly white town of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Have y'all been to Ardmore? <laughs> um, he faced racial prejudice and saw major flaws in the white judicial system. In one instance, he was literally silenced in, Louis in a Louisiana courtroom because of his race. In response to this, he decided to focus on practicing law within African-American communities and moved to the all black town of Rentiesville, Oklahoma, where he would marry P Molly Parker Franklin and start his own family in 1915. Franklin later moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma with his family in 1921. So he just got to Tulsa in 1921. In Tulsa during 1921, racial, racial tensions were extremely high. Are they still high? The town that had one of the most affluent black communities in the nation, um, the Greenwood District, also known as Black Wall Street, which created a sharp divide between blacks and whites. In May of 1921, a young black man named Dick Rowland I wonder if he's related somehow through that last name to Kelly Rowland. Anyway, was in a an elevator with a white woman named Sarah Page. It was alleged that he attempted to assault her and he was promptly arrested. There were was an altercation between a group of black and white people at the courthouse, which in the next 24 hours would escalate to a massive one day race massacre that left approximately 300 dead, much of the black population imprisoned. They didn't even talk about that part really. And when the whole commotion was going on um, around the uh, uh, centennial and the uh, Greenwood District in ruins. Franklin and his family have managed to survive the riot or the massacre. The Tulsa City Council, however, in the aftermath of the carnage, passed an ordinance that prevented the Black people of Tulsa from rebuilding their community. The city planned instead to rezone the area from, the resident from a residential to a commercial district. Franklin led the legal battle battle against this ordinance and sued the city of Tulsa before the Oklahoma Supreme Court where he won. So thank you, Cousin Buck, um, for allowing the residents to be able to rebuild. It says as a consequence, um, so-called Black, Tulsa residents could and did begin to the reconstruction of their nearly destroyed community. Franklin would, went on to write his own autobiography, but would pass away on September 24th, 1960, in Oklahoma, unable to see its final publication. Of his four children, John Hope Franklin would become a prominent historian and um, so-called Black intellectual of this time period. He contributed to the Brown versus Board of Education case and participated in the 1965 March for Voting Rights in Selma, Alabama. John Hope Franklin and his son would finalize B.C. Franklin's autobiography, My Life and Era, the autobiography of Buck Colbert Franklin. So, this was the early 1900s, uh, 1920s and um, 30s and so on that this line, this bloodline here have been 
speaking about, talking about, handling up, trying to figure out how we go ahead and get these reparations. All right, so there's Cousin Buck. And so let's fast forward to the 2000s. Now, I'm going to read an article and then maybe I'll play a little bit of um, some videos. So we have this in our minds. We keep having this in our minds. And shout out to OC the Great TV because he put me on to Johnny Cochran. I didn't know anything about Johnny Cochran after, um, you know, outside of, you know, him uh, working with uh, OJ Simpson. So... I looked up Johnny Cochran reparations proposal. A group of lawyers led by Johnny Cochran has formed a reparations assessment group to determine how legal suits could be filed, um, has introduced a bill that would procure $8 million to study the effects of slavery and come up with a formula for reparations. This was back in 2001, 2001. And let me take a look at um, this one's coming out of in the in these times dot com. Um, I also was looking at uh, our shared family history dot org, and um, the other story came out of I'm not sure, but um, I'll maybe go back to it here in a bit. Anyway, um, best chance since 1865. Okay, shout out to John Conyers. Reparations for African Americans were once a boutique demand from fringe groups of black nationalists. Really? Just them. They were the only ones. Okay. Not that the concept lacks pedigree. In 1865, Union General William Sherman, we just talked about him, set aside thousands of acres for newly freed um, by way of a special field order. And then Andrew um, uh, reversed everything that he had started. And a bandwagon began rolling in the 1990s, spurred by an elite group of black attorney attorneys, including Harvard's Charles Ogletree and the law firm of the late Johnny Cochran, but was knocked off track by the terrorist attack of 911 and the shift to the right in public discourse. The idea has now emerged as the unifying strategy for um, so-called Black activists, groups all along the political spectrum, and in it has even attracted some support from unusual suspects like Southern Christian Leader Leadership Conference, the Green Party, and newly minted Senator Chris Van Hollen the first U.S. Senator to support a study of the concept. The notion has gained such public appeal that there is a new wellspring of support for the weathered HR 40. They still trying to pass that now, y'all. This was 2017 when they wrote this. Um, Let's see. That was the one that was built, uh, written by John Conyers. Um, they, the original bill, the commission to study reparations proposals for African-Americans act was designed to, um, examine the negative effects of slavery and recommended appropriate remedies. Let's see, let's see, let's get to where, um, president, 
present day injury has already been proven, says Cam Howard, the legislative commission chair for the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America in COBRA, founded in 1987. So there's there's been these smaller um, groups of of, of um, so-called black people that have gotten together to do something towards getting repair in this country. Um, even uh, I say the whole way through um, up until present day, but it's it, it's getting a lot more um, uh, traction. A wealth study re- reveals how the plunder of slavery b- both nourished the roots of American prosperity and led to contemporary dysfunctions in so-called Black America, like <laughs> vax that thing up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Such links continue to emerge as institutions such as Georgetown, Rutgers, Harvard, um, New York Life, Adna, and J.P. Morgan disclose the slave trading skeletons in their closets. Additional studies show the racially desperate effects of the New Deal policies and mid-20th century housing discrimination to Nishi. Coates um, complied, uh, compiled much of the scholarship in his influential essay in the June tw- two th- 2014 issue of The Atlantic, The Case for Reparations, which triggered a series of forums further publicizing the issue. The domestic interest in reparations reflects a global trend. In March 2014, the 15-member Caribbean community unanimously approved a 10-point plan to demand (laughs) reparatory justice for the victims of crimes against humanity in the forms of genocide, slavery, slave trade, human trafficking is what we also need to put in here, and racial apartheid. Last year, the UN working, um, a United Nations working group issued a strong worded report urging U.S. lawmakers to implement reparations, citing a legacy of colonial history, enslavement, racial subordination and segregation, racial terrorism and racial inequality. So this was hold up last year. So that was 2016 then at the time this was written. So maybe the um, uh, United Nations has been urging for a while because my last video, if you guys watched that, please subscribe, like, share these videos. Um, I thought they were 60 years too late. Maybe they was like 58. Um, Anyways, um, maybe they've been trying to uh, push towards this for the whole time. I don't know. I have to go back and look through what the UN says. And if I have to retract what I said before, I will. Now, organizations ranging from mainstream standbys like the NAACP to the Urban League to the left-leaning by BYP 100 and movement for so-called Black Lives have come together in concert over the concept. This ascent is rare. Longtime activist Ron Daniels has formed an umbrella group, the national so-called African American Reparations Commission to leverage this heightened interest while it lasts. Oh my goodness. Y'all, y'all see, y'all see how how long and how much effort and how many people we've gotten together and how much organizing has been done. There have been people that have been working towards um, not only here in the states, but it seems like in the Caribbean as well. People have come together to um, discuss these reparations. Uh, Namibia, um, I. Don't know if you guys remember about Namibia um, and their negotiations, I think, with Germany over um, the genocide against their people. It's a shame and a scandal. How can they not see this in these um, uh, European, you know, pale skin? (laughs) 
arenas. Um, I, I don't see how they could argue against this. Um, let's see. 40% of millennials think there should be reparations for African-American descendants of enslaved people. This is a significantly higher number than the previous polls. We see the reparation struggle as one with four legs, said in Cobras Howard. Litigation lit legislation public mobilization and internationalization. We're still not up to speed, but we're on track. Okay, so where where's the conversation about Johnny Cochran? Hold up. Because I could have sworn that's what it... Okay, hold up. Hold up, hold up. This one, Cambridge.org. Okay, I'm not going to read too, too much, but I wanted to see what um, Johnny Cochran has done. Um, okay, the notion that the current descendants of slaves are owed compensation for slavery is one that receives widespread discussion and support. For example, in 1989, Representative John Conyers of Michigan proposed legislation. Um, let's see. I don't even know if I see Johnny Cochran. You know what? Okay. Um, there's lots of resources around here. I kind of wanted to um, not spend too, too much time on this video because I am... Um, I'm going to try to um, have a discussion on Clubhouse. If you guys are on Clubhouse, go ahead and um, uh, let's follow each other so we can, you know, start putting um, put some additional puzzle pieces together. Okay, so let me just read down. It says... Um, more recently, Randall Robinson, the in the debt what America owes to blacks, argued that an important step toward healing racial division and helping poor um, so-called African Americans is to compensate blacks for slavery. Randall Robinson, the debt what America owes to blacks, two thousand one. Also, a well-known group of civil rights and class action attorneys, including Harvard Law Professor Charles Ogletree, which we talked about in the last article, and Johnny Cochran is putting together a lawsuit seeking reparations for the descendants of slaves, reparations for slavery, CBS News television broadcast 2000, available from um, CBS News. Okay. The debt is on some estimates involves trillions of dollars, of course. Um, Larry Neal and James Marchetti estimate the value of unpaid incomes to slaves about um, amounts to 1.4 trillion and 3.4 trillion respectively. Well, I thought that, um, okay, so. You know, and this actually was to, um, this is out of Cambridge, but it was, um, as I was reading down, just reading a little bit um, to myself, <laughs> this is people trying to say that, write stuff against, um, against this. Um, <laughs> Whatever. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm about to go ahead and um, see what some of our people's got to say about what Johnny Cochran was getting into. And um, let me see what he has to say. A lot of people watch this guy. So. OJ Simpson was a mascot for black society. A lot of times they'll use a certain black person in order to get revenge. 
they'll 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 get one black person to do a public lynching in order to get revenge on all other black people. You understand? Like with OJ. OJ, the OJ thing was about revenge. OJ was a, re a revenge thing. They wanted to use OJ. They wanted to get a big Negro, uh, a popular Negro, and make an example out of him with that murder trial. Now, they know OJ didn't murder those people. They know that. And based on the evidence, that's why the, the jury acquitted him for those murders, because the evidence showed that he didn't do it. Black folks are so silly. You know, whatever white mommy and white daddy tells you, you, you believe it. But they wanted to use OJ as revenge for black people in LA because after the riots, a lot of white people got killed, a lot of Asian people got killed after the riots in LA. Like they don't like that. They don't like when white people get that scoreboard evened up as far as deaths. See, that they count money and deaths. So black people killed a lot of white people during the riots. They don't like talking about that. They've been wanting, they wanted to get revenge on the black folks of LA. You dig? And I was hoping that um, he would talk about, let me just see if anywhere on here he starts to talk about um, reparations. In their minds, Johnny Cochran running around doing all this shit. Then Johnny Cochran said, hey, I'm going to get Michael Jackson off. I'm, yeah, Johnny was the dude. I'm going to get Puffy off. He got Puffy off. Puffy in that murder trial. That was Johnny Cochran was Puffy's lawyer. When they, that, that club got shot up. Johnny wasn't fucking around. Then Johnny, this is, this is where he got heavy. Johnny said, okay, my next thing, they were about to get money for the people from the Tulsa riots. Because remember, those people, many of those people at that time were still alive. The one of the last survivors just died a couple of days ago. Yet he was Tupac's lawyer too. Tupac and my man Malik. Malik is a friend of mine. Well, I haven't talked to Malik in years, but he was the co-defendant. Malik was the trigger man in the um, Snoop case. In the Snoop case, I'm getting some of my cases mixed up, but the Tupac case and in the Snoop Dogg case, he represented Snoop too, and Snoop and Malik, McKinley Lee. Yeah, he got Buffy off, he got Michael Jackson off, he got Todd Bridges off. Johnny wasn't fucking around. Johnny was an OG with that lawyer game. Johnny was no joke. Johnny actually got Tookie Williams off. That he got when he was very young. He started, you know. Being a lawyer in LA back in the, uh, I want to say late 60s, early 70s, but he got Tookie Williams off some of his cases. You yeah. know? So Johnny was getting all these people off, all these black people off. And then Johnny was like, we're going to get some money, some reparations for the people of the Tulsa riot. These people, these victims, these survivors of the Tulsa riots, we about to get some reparations for them. Then he mysteriously died. Then they, that brain aneurysm thing popped up. That brain aneurysm. You didn't know he got Tookie off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got Tookie off in the early 70s. That was one of Tookie's lawyers in the 70s. He got Tookie off. Yeah, when he started, when he started talking about he's about to get some reparations, which he would have got, Johnny would have got that shit. They were like, hell no. Oh, no. And boy, you know who hated Johnny Cochran? Geraldo. Geraldo ain't shit. Geraldo used to do these shows on Johnny Cochran. A lot of y'all are not old enough to remember. I remember Geraldo. It, it, O.J. Simpson. Okay. All right. So that was one. I wanted to go back 
and see what um, this one had to say. Please follow these channels um, as they're, um, if you oh, your they're putting out stuff Airbnb. that we need to know. You might get someone looking, looking for a little, little studio. studio. But if you look Homicide is population control. Birth control pill, okay, that is birth control. Homosexuality is conception control. Mm. You prevent the egg from eating the semen. Right. You see, mm -hmm. and if you can prevent conception, you don't have to worry about abortion. And if you can prevent conception, you don't have to worry about homicide. So preventing sex between men and women in the black community is a very effective way of curtailing the black population. Mm. That we are at war. Yes. And can you... Can you give us a real thick understanding of that? Because I don't think a lot of people are grasping. I mean, because maybe bullets are not being fired at us from white society. But can you give us a... Sure. Um, in a classic book written by Sun Tzu, The Art of War, he said, basically, the best way to wage war is without armed struggle. A sophisticated military campaign would not require the loss of life but it would require the taking over of the lives of the victims. And that's exactly what's happening to African people in this country. We are not necessarily being murdered, but our lives are being murdered. Mm. So we're not given the opportunity to give fullest expression to our talents, our goals, and our ambitions. And when a group of people or any individual is no longer allowed to dream, mm -hmm. they're already dead because it is our dreams that keep us alive. And when you're not allowed to have them, death has already set in, even if it's not a physical death. Um, and I think you said it on a lecture before, and it was a, a profound point, and I don't think a lot of people actually know this, and I believe you said it, um, and that is that the birth rate, uh, that, myth that more male boy boys are born, but at a certain point, there are more females in society. Can yes. You? Uh, without question, much of the research out there is showing that they're not, there isn't a disproportionate birth rate as it relates to black boys and black girls in America. When you look at the numbers of infants born, it's almost a perfect gender balance between male and female at birth. However, because of the war against black boys and against black men that send so many of them to the prison and so many of them to a premature death, by the time we get to our late teenage years, there's the disproportionate amount of black women and an under a representative amount of black males, which unfortunately leaves a lot of black women wondering if they'll ever be able to get married. You know, and that automatically destabilizes the black family, because when you don't have men to be able to marry women, then that destabilizes and disrupts the flow of the culture. Mm. Um, and the uh, the uh, commemoration of Black Wall Street, you spoke on that. It recently just took place. Uh, can you uh, say a little bit about that? Uh, because I know that Brother Ashad uh, from the Final Call newspaper would love to have your comment on that as well. Uh, sure. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma last week. Uh, I was invited down there um, by some very good brothers and sisters. I had an opportunity to tour Black Wall Street had an opportunity to learn a lot about the history that I did not know before. And probably one of the most important things that I learned is that the struggle is not over. Uh, the city of Tulsa, the state of Oklahoma still has not paid reparations to the descendants of the victims of the Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street massacre of 1921 that our brothers and sisters sued uh, for reparations, but they were told that the statute of limitations had ran out because of the usage of language. Mm. Instead of referring to it as a hate crime or as a massacre, it was referred to as a riot. Mm. And so that terminology of it being a riot, which gives the false impression that blacks and whites were equally responsible and culpable in what happened, it stole the power and thunder away from the legal fight for reparations. Mm. So um, one of the things I learned from that, and I already knew it, but it reconfirmed, and that is we have to be careful about the language that we use. Right. But just by calling it a riot instead of a massacre, mm. that actually gave the white folks, the uh, it gave them an opportunity to escape responsibility right. Right. for what happened. 
legally die. Yes, and the city of Tulsa doesn't like to talk about Black Wall Street, and that's because if you dig deep enough, there's a lot of people still living who were either involved or who are the descendants of those who were directly involved. So when you talk about reparations and restitution, yeah. the potential for lawsuits, things get really quiet. So the brothers and sisters are still down there fighting. Um, the late Johnny Cochran, one of our greatest attorneys, uh, you know, he was going to help put forth the fight for Tulsa's Black Wall Street. And he was willing to take that fight as far as it needed to go. But as you know, he was uh, assassinated, I would say. And part of that had to do with the fact that if he was successful in Tulsa, that would have triggered lawsuits due to other racial, mar uh, racial massacres in American history. Rosewood, uh, Charleston, Wilmington. So had he been, had Johnny Cochran been successful with our brothers and sisters in earning reparations for the Tulsa massacre of 1921, that would have opened the door for brothers and sisters to get reparations for other massacres that were carried out against our people and would have ultimately led to the chief massacre, which is the Ma'afa and the enslavement of African people. So Johnny Cochran had to go because what he was doing was far too dangerous for the American government to handle. And in killing him, they killed that struggle temporarily. Mm -hmm. But the brothers and sisters in Tulsa are still pushing along. And one day they believe, and I believe that we're going to get those reparations of Tulsa and then use that as a test case to get reparations for Africans in America. Uh, Brother Colt seems like he's pushing reparation that's got at least back out there in the, in the public. And so I think that, you know, along with uh, people knowing this now about uh, Black Wall Street, that maybe this will open some more doors and get this movement going. And I just read an article. That OK, so there you have it, folks. Like um, <laughs> this right here is amazing that we're still in the uh, acquiring of the the debts owed. There, these debts are owed. So who's who's up for um, making it right now? Uh, what lawyers are out there that aren't afraid? How many of them are there that would take our case, the denationalization of our peoples? I just want to know. Anyway, um, that's pretty much all I have for this video. I will see you in the next one. And I appreciate you guys. Love you. Um, be blessed. Um, I am going to um, leave this video the same way that I come in, uh, that I came in. And I hope you guys continue to like and share and subscribe to this channel. All right. Later, folks.